called Connor, where they throw grenades through your letterbox. They throw grenades through the letterbox at their mother's home and go running off laughing. That's where the fuck I come from. So they come out with a new place and be treated by the people and, and show love 17.1 million dollar gate at Madison Square Garden, the highest gate, the highest gate there was, the broke Lennox Hills and had a whole of his record. Attendance, attendance, 50, almost 16,000 broke Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier's record. It's an honor to be a young Irish man from the middle of nowhere to come over and be treated by love by all you people. I swear, I, I have no more respect by every single person in here that's grinding for what they deserve, that's putting in that work, going against all of them, and going again what's theirs. No more respect. Keep going, keep working. With hard work, with belief, anything is possible. I'm a two-way world champion in the, in the biggest organization in free fighting period. There's no limitations where I come from. You can kick, you can knee, you can elbow. It's bare shin, bare bone. Well, it's not ready for this. And yeah, much respect to Floyd, he's a solid businessman. What he has been able to do, he is a fucking animal at what he has been able to do. But as far as real fighting, as far as true, pure, unarmed combat, Floyd don't want none of this. People won't even ask him. He wants it on the boxing rules. He wants a boxing match. He doesn't want to fight. So I want to respect everyone in here. I love everyone in Give Floyd a shout, tell him I'm coming. Tell him, tell him to run around Showtime offices. I want the 100 million cash to fight him on the boxing rules because he's, he's afraid of a real fight. Show sure, everyone, I'm not going to fight this no more. I'm going to put it back to the DJ.
Less one. Fine. Pull it from there. Get it. Get it. Get the money. Okay. Lower with control. But I ruined here. I ruined New York. The Irish ruined New York. Paul Floyd. Paul Floyd, tell him I'm right here. See what he does. He ain't gonna do shit. He ain't do fucking nothing. Shout out the Irish in New York. We built this city. We built this city with our bare fucking hands. And now we're back. Where's that bread? Where's my booty? Floyd, where you at? Where you fucking at? I'm from, I'm, I'm from a small place in, in Dublin, Ireland called Plummer. Where they throw grenades through your letterbox. 
They throw grenades through the letter box at their mother's home and go running off laughing. That's where the fuck I come from. So they come out of the new place and be treated by the people and, and show them love 17.1 million dollar gate at Madison Square Garden, the highest gate, the highest gate there was, the Brooklyn Exclusive on the Holyfield record. Attendance, attendance, the Brooklyn Exclusive on the Holyfield record. Attendance, attendance, almost 16,000 people. Almost 16,000. Bro, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier broke on. It's an honor to be a young Irish man from the middle of nowhere. To come over and be treated with love by all you people. I swear, I, I have no more respect by every single person in here that's grinding for what they deserve. That's putting in that work. Going against all them. And going again what's theirs. No more respect. Keep going. Keep working. With hard work, with belief, anything is possible. I'm the two-way world champion in the in the biggest organization in free fighting period. There's no limitations where I come from. You can kick, you can knee, you can elbow. It's bare shin, bare bone. Well, there's no ready for this. Much respect to Floyd, he's a solid businessman. What he has been able to do. He is a fucking animal at what he has been able to do. But as far as real fighting, as far as true, pure, unarmed combat, Floyd don't want none of this. I say, he does not want none of this. People won't even ask him. He wants it under boxing rules. He wants a boxing match. He doesn't want to fight. So I want to respect everyone in here. And look at the winners. Give Floyd a shout tell him I'm coming. I want the 100 million cash to fight him on the boxing rules because he's, he's afraid of a real fight. Show sure, everyone, I'm not going to fight this no more. I'm going to put it back to the DJ. Big respect, everybody, let's do it, Dick. It's only two things. It's two things I'm allowed to do this for a fucker. It's two things I'm allowed to do this for a fucker. I love everyone here. number came out, the uh, the man to the left of you said he was worth four billion dollars. So, I, 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 guess, I guess the question is, how much is Connor worth to the UFC, and then Connor, how much are you worth to the UFC? $4.2 billion. $4.2 billion, that's what I'm worth to this company. 
Connor, Eric Dame, MyMMANews.com. Question for you. Coming off a couple big fights at 170, we know your history at 145, now 155. This move to lightweight. Tell us your thoughts on it. I'm very happy with, with the 155 pound weight limit. I feel of all the divisions I've ran around and ran through, 155, I feel, will be the one where I will take over the most. So I look forward to that. Question for Connor. Connor, uh, after your last few fights, I'm just wondering is Mystic Mac back? And if so, what his prediction for the next fight is? You know, I feel Eddie. I've nothing against. Careful, him. be careful. I've nothing against Edward. Oh whoa, oh whoa. Be careful. What you gonna do? Oh whoa. You gonna do something over there? Be careful. Shut your fucking mouth. I run New York. I run this whole shit. And Mystic Mac predicts I'm gonna KO, KO you inside one round. Go ahead, sir. Question, question for you, Colin, for you, uh, chosen one. Uh, every, everybody from Michael Jackson to Muhammad Ali and everybody in between has had the chance to perform at Madison Square Garden. How much are you looking forward to that? Listen, the Irish, we built this damn town. I'm saying serious. We built this city. Now we're back. Now we're coming to claim what's ours. So it's an honor to be here. Coming in here, listening to all these fans. It truly is a dream come true. I cannot wait to perform for you. I'm gonna take out one of your own. I'm gonna cash your own money. But make no mistake, it's all love. The Irish love New York and, and I'm honored to be here. Push it for Connor. Connor. A question for Connor. Can you give us an update on your leg? How serious was the injury and was it possible that it was going to preclude you from listen, fighting on this card? Listen, that fight was five, five weeks ago. I came out of that fight fresher than I went in. Look at Nate's face. Nate will never look the same. I came out brand new, I had a bruised foot. I agreed to this fight. 10 days ago I agreed to all of this and then I don't know what was going on. Something went on with that other side. But I was chilling here waiting for the call and then the call came last minute. I jumped on a, on a plane and here we are. So my, I'm brand new. And at the end of the uh, press conference at 2.02, the final thing that you said was you had a feeling that shit was gonna hit the fan. Can you explain what you meant by that and did it hit the fan or did you weather that storm? I just, I just, said, I just said it out straight, beg me and they begged me. So that was all I wanted, that was all I asked. A uh, question for Eddie. How did you get this done? Because it seemed like just a few days ago they were targeting you and... He Habib. got it done by signing his last contract. He didn't even negotiate new money for himself. Imagine that. Look at everybody up here. They're all dressed like me, they're all trying to talk like me, they're all trying to be me. Everyone in the game wants this fight. This is the lottery fight. And this man took it on his last contract. Imagine that. Imagine getting the biggest fight in the history of the game and saying, shut your mouth, kid. You're getting paid what you got your last fight and you're lucky you're even getting that. Yes, sir, and sign it. That's what happened. You done yet? You done yet? Hey, I, I, was, I, was, I was okay with the money. I, wasn't gonna, I was gonna negotiate the money. Because <laughs> this guy's easy, it's easy money. Easy money, easy. And if I could, just one more. Uh, Connor, can you tell us what you're gonna do with the titles? Uh, Dana said today that you will keep the featherweight belt up until this fight. I'm gonna wrap one on one shoulder, I'm gonna wrap the other on the other shoulder, and you're gonna need a fucking army to come take them belts off me. Uh, this is a question for Connor. Uh, my name is Josh Burnett from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. 
A uh, quick question. When you prepared for Nate Diaz, it was a very specific camp. When you prepare for Eddie, will you have such a specific camp or you go a bit more like you used to? I've been whooping his, sty his style, I've been whooping that style a long, long time. He's a stocky, stuffed wrestler with an overhand, that's it. So, I've been, I've been beating these guys up. Tell him before. the truth, you ain't got a fucking shot. Tell him the truth. One you round. ain't got a shot. One round you're gonna You ain't got a shot. Your coach gonna... knows you ain't got a shot. One round. And anybody who knows your anything coach. about Fuck fighting you and your knows coach. you ain't got a fucking shot. Fuck you shot. and your coach. You ain't got a shot. Connor, Connor, one more question. You're here because you're the easiest student in this division. That's why you're here. Connor, one more question. What did you think Take about them stupid ass glasses off. Yeah. Make me. 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 You took them off. You took them off. Thank you. You took them off. I caught a last question. What did you think about Eddie's fight against Sasanyas? I thought it was very sloppy. The sl shot selection was very, very poor. He got blessed. He got blessed with a lucky shot. His UFC career has been horrendous. He's very, very lucky to be in the position he is in. He understands that. That's why he took this fight on the money he was on the last fight. I mean, that says it all. And, and sorry to hog the microphone. Last question to Eddie. Uh, what were your genuine thoughts on the, on the Diaz fight, Diaz McGregor? He, this guy got eight minutes of fighting him, that's it. He quits after eight minutes, every fight. He's, a, he's, a, he's not a championship fighter, he's never been. And he's never, ever fought anyone in UFC like me, ever. Hey, Dana. Just another broke bum trying to sell some shit. That's it. He's broken, he's desperate. And he's trying to make it like, oh, McGregor's this, McGregor's that. We've heard it all before. He's just another broke bum that can't, can't afford to pay his fucking bills. So that's all that is. Hey, Dana, first of all, thank you for bringing it to New York. I'm a New York native. Thank you for bringing the UFC to New York. Thank you, sir. This question's for Connor, uh, part of WFN, CBS Sports Radio. Connor, you've been known to make predictions. You're known as Mystic Mac. What's your prediction for UFC 205? Like I said, he's chinny. He has a chin. He gets cracked, he gets dropped. It's happened throughout his career. He's a weathered fighter. He's on his way out. He's very, very lucky to be in the position he's in. One round, it will take me to knock him out. And uh, Connor, follow up. Ariel hinted at it about the foot. And uh, Eddie's known as a cardio freak. Are you worried about the not being able to cycle? Yes, on the yes foot? he is. Yeah, we'll see. In, yes, he in, is. In four months, I overcame a triathlete. I out, uh, outlasted a triathlete with 30 pounds on me and whooped his ass. This guy's a balloon. He ain't no cardio machine. What are you talking about? He's blown up. One clinch and he's gas, gassing for air as well. He spent $300,000 on that last camp and gassed out eight I minutes made in. And $300,000 and gassed out eight minutes. minutes in. Cool, thanks, man. And one question for Cowboy. And I guess, and I can. Here you are on a, on a days again, listening to Connor talk. Man, I could see you back there, just wondering what this experience was like for you. Oh man, this is New York City, man. This is Square Garden, man. I'm so pumped to be here. But uh, listening to this Joker talk, just we all just sit back here and laugh, so. It is what it is. Another broke, jealous, bitter fire. The game seems to be full of them. I've got nothing but love for everybody up here. You know what I'm saying? It's just bitterness and hate and negativity towards me because of what I'm doing, because of what I'm making. That's all that is. Uh, Gabe Winnissian from the Daily Ramen. I have a question for Eddie Alvarez. In an interview with CBS in August, you said that Conor McGregor was not a good fighter, and uh, quote, that he ain't shit. Um, you're going into this fight now. Do you still maintain those strong feelings going into this fight? When, 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 I, when I mention fighter, you guys are thinking about technique. I'm not thinking about technique. I'm thinking, when I say fighter, I'm, I'm talking about how you deal with adversity, how you deal with being in a bad situation. He deals terribly with being in bad situations and don't come back. Now, Eddie Alvarez, um, obviously, this is going to be a huge fight for you. However, is this the same strategy you're going to use that you used against uh, Anthony Pettis? Grind it out, get him against the cage, take him down. No, 
No, definitely not. I'm with, I'm with Mark Henry now, and uh, since I've been with Mark, Henry, Mark I've been Henry. growing a bunch. <laughs> Fuck John Cavanaugh. Look that Podman. Hey, you got two jujitsu coaches. <laughs> two jujitsu coaches. Why you got two jujitsu coaches? Anyway, come November 12th, you guys will see. There, there is no Santa Claus. He don't exist. Now, Connor, one question for you. The only weakness we've seen in your arsenal was your wrestling against Chad, Chad Mendes. Have you improved that one that go? Up? How did that fight go again? That's the only weakness we've seen. That's the only weakness we've seen in your career. Last time I checked, he, he was unconscious. What are you talking about? He's gonna be, he's gonna be shooting for his life. But it's a long 25 minutes in there. I can hit you from anywhere. And that's what's gonna happen to him. I'm, he's gonna be shooting, panic, and I'm gonna be hitting him from everywhere. Sooner or later, he's gonna fall. One of those elbows, one of those shots are gonna dig into that soft, sweet spot into the temple. And that's all she wrote. Two-way world champion. UFC history. New York. The Irish are back. Questions for Dana, Scott Fontana with AM New York. Dana, what is the plan for if Connor wins the belt? What's going to happen with the featherweight belt? We'll figure that out if when it happens. What would you say to that, Connor? Sorry, what did you say again? If you win both belts, what are you going to do? Are you going to defend both belts? They're going to they're going to have to gather an army to try and take one of them off me, and that's how straight. No one's going to be there. One's going to be there. I'm going to be picking and choosing who I want to destroy next, and that's it. Would you fight Aldo again? Let's see what happens with Aldo. I mean, it's hard to even think of, of Aldo. I KO'd him in 13 seconds. I traveled around the world with him. He pulled out on two weeks notice. If Frankie was good enough and he had to came through that last one, it would have been me, me and Frankie in the, for, the, for the featherweight belt here. He just wasn't up to scratch. So I'm going to let that featherweight division play out, see how it goes. But I'm the featherweight world champion. Now in November, I'm going to be the lightweight world champion, and I'm going to hold two of them consecutively. Not a shot. That's it. Not a shot. You ain't got a shot. Beltless. You'll be beltless November 12th. You'll be beltless. Not a 45, not a 55. You'll have to give up the little boy belt, and you're not getting the big boy belt. Connor, since you love talking about money, what's your expectation of uh, what are you going to make for 205? Split between people who loved him and people who hated him. My name is Muhammad. Y'all keep calling me Cassius. I'm tired of telling you. You know, you're intelligent. My name is Muhammad Ali, not Cassius. There was anybody special who gave you the name? Yes, sir. My leading teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad's influence is growing. Not only does he give Ali his new name, he introduces him to Sanji Roy, who becomes Ali's first wife in August of 64. Muhammad Ali had four wives. Sanji, Kalila, Veronica, and now Lonnie. I found the first wife in, in a strange way, maybe the most interesting. She was very firmly in love with him. Their honeymoon is short-lived. We no longer had Cassius Clay. We now had Muhammad Ali, who was a member of the Nation of Islam, which made him very unpopular. It was getting very hard to find a place where he could fight. Originally, the listed rematch was set for Boston. Then Muhammad suffered a hernia. The fight was postponed. Boston washed its hands of it. And it finally wound up in Lewiston, Maine, which was one of the few places that would take it. Then, two months before the rematch, Malcolm X, who had broken with Elijah Muhammad to embrace Orthodox Islam, is gunned down by members of the Nation of Islam on February 21st, 1965. Muhammad Ali had broken from Malcolm and sided with Elijah Muhammad. So there was concern that Malcolm's followers might exact retribution against Ali. The rumor had been spread that there was a carload of gunmen coming up from New York to kill Muhammad Ali in the ring. Ali Liston, too, was a mess. It was a mess outside the ring, and it was a mess once the fight started. 
Midway through round one, Ali hits Liston with a blow that would become infamous as the Phantom Punch. Did you see the punch? Did you see it? Was it the punch heard around the world? It wasn't even a punch seen around the world. The punch was hard enough to knock Liston down, but he thought Liston could have gotten up. It took about eight seconds after nine and 10 that the crowd began to chant, fix, fix, fix. Ali's second disputed win over Liston does little to win over his boxing critics. He has other critics as well. A certain portion of black America loved him. Another portion of black America did not love him. The black community was divided. Those who thought integration was a great thing and those who did not think of integration in that way but thought of equal rights and, and our freedom, equality, and justice. I'm not out there marching and going places I'm not wanted. Those of us who were young, who understood our manhood, and who took pride in it, we were not asking to be a part of white America, but demanding our rights just like any other citizen. Ali's support of the Nation of Islam's separatist policy alienates many in the civil rights movement, including Floyd Patterson, who turns his November 65 bout with Ali into a social, political, and religious battle. He said uh, a black Muslim has no place being heavyweight champion in America, and that he, as a Catholic, was going to bring the title back to this country. Floyd was a nice man. But his approach was what we call an Uncle Tom approach, doing all the things that white America wanted you to do. You ain't nothing but an Uncle Tom for white people. What's my name, Uncle Tom Negro? I jump on you now. What's my name? When Muhammad Ali got him in the ring, he became pretty cruel in his beating of Floyd. He was really giving him a lesson talking to him hitting him and talking to him. Ali would disable Patterson, then step back, admire his work, and then beat on him some more. Ali beats Patterson by technical knockout. Two months later, he sues his wife Sanji for divorce. She'd lost favor with her husband's increasingly influential Muslim inner circle. They said it was because she wore makeup. She wore daring dresses. They didn't want her because they had already picked out Kalila, who was working in a Nation of Islam restaurant. His brief marriage now over, so is his six-year contract with the Louisville Sponsoring Group. Herbert Muhammad becomes Ali's manager. Herbert Muhammad was the son of Elijah Muhammad, who Muhammad Ali counted as his spiritual father. Uh, Herbert was an extension of that. Herbert Muhammad joins with pro football superstar Jim Brown and lawyer Bob Arum to form their own boxing promotion company, Main Bout. What we said was the heavyweight champion of the world is boxing and we should control boxing. But Main Bout can't control the U.S. draft board. Ali was rejected for service in 64 when he failed the written test. But the Vietnam War is escalating in February of 66 and the Army has lowered its standards. Weeks before his bout with Ernie Terrell in Chicago, Ali is notified that Uncle Sam wants him. The fight was doing extraordinarily well when the U.S. government reclassified Muhammad Ali from 1Y and made him 1A, and a television reporter went to Ali, who was training in Miami, before anybody could reach him. I just don't understand yet how I can be reclassified as 1A without testing me in no way, just calling me like this, and I just don't understand it. In other words, uh, you think they called you only because you're the heavyweight champion. And the Muslim, too. And that's when Ali said, I got nothing against the Viet Cong. They never called me the N-word. Everything hit the fan. Ali declares that if he's drafted, he won't fight in Vietnam. Ali put it in racial and religious terms that made him a hero to millions of people who thought that it was a bad war. When he basically said, I ain't going, 
Um, a lot of us were kind of like, yeah, baby, <laughs> I ain't going either. I'm just trying to figure out another way of doing it so that I don't have to go to jail in the process. Well, then you're, you, you're not apologizing for the unpatriotic uh, uh, statements that you made. That'll be taken up with the government. Ali's unpopular stand causes Chicago politicians to scuttle the Terrell fight, leaving his management looking for another fight in a new venue. We wanted to fight in uh, Pittsburgh, and they ruled it out there, and then they tried Maine, but they didn't want us in Maine. The growing controversy over his anti-draft stand makes Ali toxic in the U.S., forcing him to win his next four fights in Canada and Europe, where he's a bigger draw than ever, a point not lost on one Texas millionaire. I got a call from this real character, Judge Roy Hoffines, who owned the Astrodome in Houston, and he said, you bring that boy down here, nobody is going to tell him he can't fight here. Ali knocks out Cleveland Williams before a record-setting indoor crowd. Smelling another box office bonanza, New York hosts Ali's next victory over Ernie Terrell. Ali is now 28-0 in the ring and still 1A in the draft. In April of 67, he finally gets his draft notice and reports to the induction center in Houston to begin one of the longest, toughest fights of his life. Former world heavyweight champion Cassius Clay refused to take the oath of induction into the army. The black Muslim fighter, who is also known as Muhammad Ali, was immediately stripped of his title by the World Boxing Association. When a guy says he's not going to fight for his country, that irritates a whole lot of people. He moved from the sports pages to the front pages. Within days, Ali is stripped of his license to box in all 50 states. Nine top Negro athletes meet with Cassius Clay to discuss his anti-draft stand. Jim Brown and Bill Russell organized a summit meeting in Cleveland. Clay's induction refusal cost him his title, and he faces a possible five-year prison sentence. The Army was willing to make a deal. They were willing to guarantee that he'd go on special services, and he would be able to box. Behind the scenes, Herbert Muhammad, as a businessman, looked upon that as a possible option. The meeting started with them talking to Ali about accepting the deal. You wouldn't have to worry about being a soldier as such. You can do public relations. But Ali's attitude was, nope, <laughs> don't want a deal. Two weeks later, Ali is convicted of draft evasion in federal court. Sentenced to five years in prison and banned from boxing for three years, he remains free while his case is appealed. Whatever suffering or punishment I may have to take, it'll all be because of my religion. He was unafraid of the political repercussions, unafraid of any cultural repercussions, unafraid of losing money. He said he would probably fight again, but it was okay if he didn't. Long as he believed that he was the people's champ, that was good enough for him. A month after his conviction, Ali marries 17-year-old Belinda Boyd with the approval of Nation of Islam leaders. She fully supports her husband's refusal to be drafted. He said, I can't kill anybody. I just said, trust me, you'll be the greatest man ever lived if you don't go. Facing five years in prison and unable to fight while appealing his case, newlywed Ali needs to earn money, so he embarks on a college lecture tour. I would like to hear this from you, and I want the world and the cameras to hear. Who's the heavyweight champion of the world? The student audiences loved his opposition to the war in Vietnam, but they were very much opposed when he spoke to them against the idea of interracial dating, against the idea of living in the same community. During those three and a half years that he wasn't fighting, uh, basically the only two things that he was doing uh, was going on college campuses, and the other was being on television with Howard Cosell. What do you say to that? I predict that the fans will be angry, the experts, for misleading them so much. 
I think that his relationship with Howard Cosell was critical to his acceptance by America. Howard had the deepest respect for the champ. Howard many times privately uh, defended Ali and Ali's right to express himself and the right to feel the way he felt about where we were with civil rights at those times. But Howard also didn't take any punches. If he felt like Ali had overstepped his bounds, he would confront it. It was part of the chemistry of these guys. You had two gigantic egos. After three and a half years in exile, Ali remains free as his appeals proceed in federal court. And while politics cost Ali his boxing license, politics provides a chance to fight again. Georgia has no state boxing commission. Individual municipalities can sanction a fight. So black state Senator Leroy Johnson strikes a deal with Atlanta's white mayor, Sam Massell. Leroy Johnson said, I want this fight to happen. I carry a lot of boats with me. Thus, Ali's comeback begins, surprisingly, in the Deep South. Here's an African-American reviled around America. Suddenly, Atlanta is embracing him. He said, I got my license. I'm going to fight in Georgia. I'm going to fight in Georgia. I said, in Georgia? <laughs> I said, down south? He said, yeah. I said, oh, Lord, you in trouble now. Ali returns to the ring on October 26, 1970. I don't believe that anybody is happier than this young man to once again step into the ring. 28-year-old Ali was stripped of his title, but he's never lost a fight, and Jerry Quarry is not considered competitive. Ali opens a cut over Quarry's eye in round three, and the fight is stopped. Inactivity is deadly for any fighter. And for Muhammad Ali to have come back and, and still display the incredible hand speed and fluidity that he showed was amazing. While Ali's draft division appeal works its way up to the Supreme Court, the NAACP sues the New York State Athletic Commission in federal court, arguing that their ban on Ali is discriminatory. Their ban is lifted. Free to fight in New York again, Ali stops Oscar Bonavina at Madison Square Garden in December 1970. It's over! Ali is the knockout winner! Setting up a title shot against Joe Frazier for an unprecedented $5 million purse. Now we have a chance to see who the real champion of the world is. That was revolutionary. You know, $2.5 million apiece? Wow. Back then, that was a vast sum of money. Even Mickey Mantle was not making that much money. Oh, well, let Joe Frazier talk all he We got a few miles to straighten all this mess up. He brought people to the sport that didn't even necessarily follow boxing. They just liked Muhammad Ali. I have fixed up the round that Joe Frazier will go down. You got this person who's standing up, and he's, you know, he's been stripped of his title. People wanted to see who is this guy. His fights meant more than just the sport of boxing. His fights were like a fight for justice. Ali was carrying the weight of everything. I don't think it's possible to overstate how much Ali embodied the hopes, aspirations, beliefs of young people in general and young African Americans in particular. Joe's gonna come out smoking and I ain't gonna be joking. The bout is set for March 8th, 1971. As the fight approaches, the battle between two unbeaten heavyweights becomes far more than a boxing match. If you were a liberal, you were rooting for Ali. If you were conservative, you were rooting for Joe. It was a clash of cultures. There were the people who were uh, demanding civil rights, who were against Vietnam, and the people who thought Vietnam was right. Then, damn it, we're going to put our views in the ring and settle it once and for all. March 8, 71. The world flat out stopped. The apartment that we lived in was going crazy for that fight. We were glued to the radio. I can still see Ali leaning back over the ropes, saying, no contest. Meanwhile, Frazier's pounding him, you know, 20 times. Ali 
absorbed an enormous amount of punishment, gave out an enormous amount of punishment. Yeah, and when the 15th came and they said he'd been knocked down, it was like, this can't be. Ali gets quickly to his feet, but the damage is done. Ali suffers his first loss. It's Frazier by unanimous decision. This can't have happened. This is impossible. It was impossible not because we didn't believe Joe Frazier could beat Muhammad Ali. It was impossible because his beating him meant they were right. And they couldn't be right. And the right-wing idiots and the hard hat guys and the ugly Americans, they were standing in the way of history. They were standing in the way of change. They were on the side of wrong. And so they couldn't be right. They just couldn't. In the first blush of defeat, Ali was gracious and elegant. He was perfect in giving Frazier credit. I've been always handing out the defeat, so now I'm defeated, and now I can see how other people felt. And when I do come back, if I ever do, I'll have a more of a hunger of determination, which is something you lose in the intoxication of so-called greatness. By the next morning, he'd been robbed. He went on every late night talk show. He convinced half of America or more that he had won a fight. And it killed Frazier. And he was the only one who believed, coming out of that fight, that he would be champion again. Four months after his unanimous loss to Frazier, Ali wins a stunning unanimous decision in the Supreme Court, which overturns his conviction for draft evasion. I mean, nobody would have believed that that could have happened when Ali refused to step forward. With prison no longer looming, Ali is free to renew his quest to reclaim the title that had been taken from him, a title now held by George Foreman. Ali's momentous match against Foreman is an event unlike anything boxing has ever seen. In 1974, promoter Don King and a consortium of backers make a deal with Zaire Strongman, President Mobuto Sese Seiko, to host a worldwide live satellite broadcast of the Rumble in the Jungle. Ali basically showed that he could transcend the sport. He brought half of the media of the world to Kinshasa Zaire. Ten long years after he first shook up the world, 32-year-old Ali is once again challenging a heavily favored champion. Foreman was uh, the second coming of Sonny Liston. Remember, this wasn't an ordinary heavyweight. This was a guy who could knock down walls. Everybody felt that Ali was going to get hurt. This was a, you know, this was a monster. I was so afraid that George Foreman was going to, going to kill Ali. Both fighters train in Zaire for the bout on October 30th, but it's Ali who is embraced by throngs of African fans. It's unreal the amount of people, 10 to 15,000 people in the crowd following him, just shouting his name. Ali Bumaye. Ali Bumaye. He'd say, stop the car, and he'd get out, and he'd, Bumaye, Bumaye. He just wanted to create a crowd. Pretty soon, you couldn't even walk across the street. All of that worked in Ali's favor. I mean, he was playing psychological games. He's punching voodoo dolls. He's, he's got people beating on drugs. The champ is here. Do, 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 do. The champ is here. Me and maybe one other person thought he could beat George Foreman. He believed it. He believed it. Ali's confidence isn't shared by many boxing experts. But during the fight, Ali would add rope dope to the lexicon and a great new chapter to his legend. Ali stands back, ties his man up, cleans on the ropes. Ali goes back on the ropes, and the ropes go back more. And Foreman misses by that much. Wild left hand is not scoring. Angelo sends his corner guys around to the corners. He's just tighten the ropes, tighten the ropes. And Ali's saying, oh, leave him, leave him. <laughs> Ali formed, in his mind, he formed the rope dope right there and then. To take that kind of punishment from a guy like George, you know, who knocked most guys out like they were rag dolls, I, I can't fathom taking those kind of blows from a guy who punches that hard. Those punches could crack ribs. How could you take this in your body? And Ali was taking it. And 
uh, Foreman was punching himself out. I had predicted that Foreman was gonna annihilate him. And in between rounds, when he started to wear George down, he said, hey, big fella, what do you think now? Not George out. When Muhammad Ali put George down, he had proven that he is indeed the greatest. The great man has done it. Ali beats Foreman. Humiliates. He stops and he says, fellas, you'll never know what this means to me. That should have been his retirement. How can you top that? You went through the trials, your ups and your downs, your glory times. This is the time to retire. He had proven the point. You can't go any further once you prove the point. And there's something about the romance of athletics that it's hard for people to give up. For him, every fight was a, another drama, another circus, and he loved every minute of it. All those available ladies, all this love and admiration, very hard to walk away from that. When Elijah Muhammad dies in February of 75, his son Wallace leads the majority of the nation of Islam toward traditional Sunni Islam. Ali, who has always had white men in his corner, embraces the change. Prejudice is a two-way street, you know? He was driving down one side of it at one point in his life. Not unlike Malcolm X, who had a similar journey, and he evolved. He said, whites can become Muslims. Now he says, so you can become a Muslim. And he hugged me. There wasn't any racism in Ali. Later that year, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos plays host to the third Ali Frazier fight, the Thrilla in Manila, on October 1st, 1975. They'd been the two most dominant fighters of their time. Towards the end of their career, oh, here they are again in this big fight, and this is going to be the culmination of it all. For both fighters, it would also mark the beginning of the end. The fight took place at about 11 a.m. Manila time, outside the hot Philippine sun was beating down. And inside, this fight between these two great athletes was going on. These two guys was going at each other like they was going to just kill each other. They both took an enormous beating. They were both heroic. Pivot. After 14 rounds of battle in the sweltering heat, Frazier and Ali, both mentally and physically spent, go to their corners to await the final round. That moment that you're sitting in your, on your stool, your, your, your eyes swollen shut, or your legs are gone. <sighs> You're totally exhausted. You look across and see your opponent, and he is just as in bad shape as you are. All of a sudden, your mind and your heart says, that's ready to go? And either you answer yes or no. Most guys say no. The special ones say yes. Ali was the one who said yes. Joe couldn't answer the bell. And Ali just passed out in the ring. It's all over. He said it was the nearest thing to die. In the year after his punishing victory over Frazier, Ali defends his title four times, including a brutal 15-round win over Ken Norton. His longtime ring doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, sees the writing on the wall. Pacheco went to Norton's locker room and told him, congratulations, you just ended Ali's career. Norton had lost, but Ali was physically beat up. The following year, his speed and skills diminished. Ali survives a 15-round slugfest with Ernie Shavers. Muhammad Ali, not down but hurt. The hardest hitting heavyweight in boxing. Said that Ernie Shavers hit me so hard that my ancestors in Africa turned over in their graves which was a fabulous line, except the way that he said it was just the beginning of a slur in his speech. In February of 78, Ali loses his title to Leon Spinks, a novice with just seven fights under his belt. But he's not done yet. Fights Spinks again, beats him, regains the title, and then Don King gets Ali to fight Larry Holmes, 
and I was absolutely horrified. The Holmes bout is set for October 1980, a year after Ali's last fight. All right. See, we got some money, see? Oh, shit. We just got some money. We good. You got some money, you? Mr. Wood got some money in the fight. Thank <laughs> you. 